Good evening, family. Good evening, family. Welcome to another dynamic hour of power. Amen. Amen. Truly, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will continue to rejoice and be glad in it. Those of you in the virtual world, thank you for tuning in to Champions for Christ International Ministry, where our spiritual parents are Dr. William Wynn and Lady Rita Wynn. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to go ahead and start this dynamic time off right by reciting our vision. The vision of Champions for Christ is to fundamentally strengthen the community by empowering each individual through caring, feeding, and protecting them through the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let's recite the mission. The mission of Champions for Christ is to restore the fallen, seek the lost, and ensure the spiritual health of the community through biblically educating, empowering, and inspiring the people to walk in the purpose that God has commissioned for their lives. Hallelujah, hallelujah. As you hear me say, those are the blueprint for champions. Those are the blueprints for savages for Christ, amen? And we should exemplify that in everything we do and in everything we say, amen? All right, tonight's reading or the scripture will, comes from, will come from Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. And the word of God reads, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling, the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We have to live our life according to our calling. We cannot fake it. We have to be authentic. We have to be transparent because that is the only way that we would draw people in. Amen? Amen. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> oh, gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you right now in the precious name of Jesus to say thank you. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for everything that you have done for us this day, Lord God. Father God, we thank you for ordering our steps. We thank you for directing our paths. Lord God, we even thank you for making our crooked roads straight, Lord God, when we, we made detours or wanted to make detours, Father. Father God, we thank you for keeping us in your loving arms and in your care, Lord God. Father God, we thank you for the many blessings, Lord God, that you bestowed upon us, even when we did not deserve it, Lord. 
Father God, we ask you right now, Lord God, in the precious name of Jesus, oh God, that you permeate this atmosphere right now, Lord God, so, and so that you can have your way with us individually as well as collectively, Lord God. Father God, saturate this place so strong, Lord God, that when people enter, Lord God, burdens will be removed, yokes will be destroyed. Lord God, whatever they came in here burdened with, Lord God, it will fall, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Father God, we ask you right now, Lord God, to bless our spiritual parents, oh God. Pastor Wynn, Lady Wynn, Father God, continue to commune with them, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Father God, we decree and declare right now, Lord God, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, Father. And any thought, any tongue that rises up against them, oh God, it is condemned in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you for blessing us, oh God, with such parents, spiritual parents, Lord God, because they are the epitome, Lord God, of true servants, Father. And we thank you, Lord. Father God, I thank you right now for the word, Lord God, that will come from our spiritual father. Father God, bless him, Lord God. Father God, and the word that you have for him, Lord God, we decree and declare that it will fall on fertile ground and it will take root, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And Father, when he has completed the task, Lord God, replenish him, Father. And Lord God, replenish his rear, replenish his wife, Lord God, because she supports him, Lord God, wholeheartedly. And Father God, when it's all said and done, oh God, we will be sure to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. It's in Jesus' holy name, Lord God, and we declare it is so. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You're happy to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Put your hands together. God bless this midweek service. Wonderful Wednesday. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Man, it has been one week, and I'm glad that I'm here tonight. I need to be revived, restored, refurbished, reeducated. I need the word of God tonight. I can't speak for you. I'm just speaking for me. I need to be recharged. Tell somebody tonight, I need to be recharged. Those on TV, tell somebody at your house, you need to be recharged. Amen. Amen. I'm excited to be here tonight. To God be the glory, honor, and praise. I want to dive right into where God got me tonight. Psalms chapter 57, verses 1 through 6. As we stand. I don't want to play around today. I ain't got time to chill either with you today. I got to get some of this in. As they say, I got to eat some of this. Amen. Here we go right here. Look at what it says. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. 
is, <laughs> just that right there, is enough to make you want to pray. David is saying right here, have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Oh my God. Until the what? Disaster has passed. I cry out to God, most high to God, who vindicates me, Jesus. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who boldly pursue me. Look, look at what it says right here. He sends, he sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness, Jesus Christ. I am in the midst of lions. Hold on. Has anybody in here been in the midst of lions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know y'all like to say enemies, but I have to put a name to them because sometimes your enemy is so bad, they're like lions. Kings of the enemies. Kings of the deceivers. Yeah, he kings. I'm in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell amongst ravenous beasts. He said, I'm forced to dwell amongst these beasts, these lions, if you would, who are my enemies. Some of you have to work with these people you know don't like you. So, some of you have to live with people you know don't like you. <laughs> yeah, some of you go to church with people who don't, okay. <laughs> so you go know, church people don't like you. Uh, not in here or there in TV land. They, they, somebody saying, I feel that. Men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted. Wow. He's praying. Now he comes to the point where he's encouraging himself. He said, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth, we're going to get excited on number six here. I couldn't wait to get to this right here, Mother Ann. Look at what it says in six. Verse six says, they spread a net for my feet. Who, who spread a net for his feet? Them lions, them enemies. Come on now, stay with me. You ain't got to be smart. Just pay attention. They, they spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. Let me read that again. They spread a net for my feet. All your enemies um, are spreading the net for your feet trying to foot clip you. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my, somebody say that, path. They came where I was walking and dug a pit in my path. I was minding my own business and they came and dug a pit for me. Look at what these hands right here in the last cloth. But they have what? Fallen, oh my God, into it who? You ought to put your hands together for that one. I want to pull a text tonight God gave me today. How to handle a crisis before it handles you. How to handle a crisis before it handles you. You. Father, we thank you, God, from all walks of life. We've come together tonight, God, to bask in your glory. Thank you, Father, for allowing us this opportunity. Let us share anything that's not like you. As we press toward the mark of the higher calling, remove these enemies, Father. Oh, we thank you that the snares and the traps that they try to set before us, God, they fall in them. Thank you for your grace. Oh, thank you for your mercy. I speak healing in the land, mentally, physically, spiritually, financially, families, whatever it may be, God, I speak healing in this land. Fathers talking to daughters again, mothers talking to sons. Father, I speak healing. Lord, marriage is being mended. Children, Lord, loving on each other again. Lord, I speak healing. Healing in this land. This Wednesday night, we are celebrated, Father, like it's Sunday. Because you are a God that never change. 
And once we get on your team, why should we? We should continue to walk in your image and after your likeness. Lord, let this word go forth on great ground. Anoint the ears that they might hear, Lord, the hearts that they might receive. Lord, speak through me to these, your people. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, tell a neighbor on your way to your seat how to handle a crisis before it handles you. How to handle a crisis before it handles you you. One, one thing's for sure. That's enough, y'all. Y'all don't y'all get to talking about what you're eating tonight. I have to watch people at my church because I tell them to say something, say the title, and the next thing you know, they're over there talking about where you're going to eat at <laughs> after service. How to handle a crisis before it handles you. One thing we all have in common is that we all have crisis. Now, your crisis might not be big as mine or as important to me as my crisis is. In fact, the crisis that I have might not even be a crisis to you, but that's my own. God don't put no more on us than we can bear. So what's my crisis might not be yours. What the Bible says, what God has for me, it is for me. And sometimes that can be a crisis. Yeah, he say trials come to make us strong. He has to allow these trials to come. These crises play multiple roles in our lives. Within crisis are the seeds of opportunity. So when a crisis comes, it's not that bad. Inside of a crisis, there are seeds of opportunity. But we don't look at it that way. We look at a crisis as all bad. And the reason we think that crises are all bad is because we have not much control. We have very little control during a crisis. That's why it becomes a crisis, because we can't speak it out the way. We can't ignore it. We can't talk to somebody or pay it off. You know, the crisis come, and a crisis is out of your hands. Now, some people might look at that and say, it went but $50. I would have just paid that off. You'd be like, $50 hard to come by over here. That's crisis. So don't ever look at nobody else and look at their crisis and toot your little nose up at them. Yours is coming. Oh, yours is coming, and you might not be able to handle yours. You might not be as safe for real as that person is. When writing in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. I like this. One represents danger, and the other represents opportunity. And I'm quoting one of my favorite presidents, John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy said it, so I can't make it no simpler. He said, when written, when written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters, one representing danger and the other representing opportunity. So what he's really saying is, how do you view your crisis? Do you see your crisis as an opportunity or do you see your crisis as danger? A lot of people don't like stress. A lot of people don't like strain. A lot of people don't like to be pulled. A lot of people don't like to be challenged, but they, like, want, they want everything. You seen people like that. You got people work for you that they want everything, but they don't want to do nothing. You got to tell them everything they have to do over and over again. And after a while, it's not the fact that they don't know how to do it. It's the fact that they're too lazy to do it. But, they want, but now they're in a crisis. They're in a crisis situation because they're lazy. A lot of people get into crisis situations because of their lethargicness. They know the way to go, but they see the strain. I might get a couple of stress marks from this one, so therefore I'm not going to do it. Baby, get those stress marks if it's going to catamount you to your future. Get those stress marks if it's going to help you. There cannot be a crisis next week. My schedule is already full. Who feel like that? That there, are some, there are some people who say, hey, hey, God, I'm, I'm praying. Hey, I don't bring nothing this week now because this, this, this Freak Neek week. I don't need no crisis Freak Neek week because I'm going over to Greenbrier get my boogie on this week. I don't need no crisis this week. My girl coming in town. My week is already full. Some people are saying, I can't take nothing else. Some people are saying when it comes to a crisis, 
I can't deal with anything else because it seems like the smallest of things when you're already filled up to here are the things that knock you over. But it wasn't the smallest of things. It was all the things before. You just couldn't handle the way. Crisis. So what you do, start crying and snotting and getting mad with people, blaming everybody because of where you are, instead of looking at the opportunity like, like Paul and say, see, look at God. God can trust me. Listen. That's why I'm going through all these afflictions, because God can trust me. He ain't saying, look at all these afflictions. I didn't get snake bit because God didn't love me. I got snake bit because God can trust me, Jesus. You have to look at your situation, look at those crises as opportunities and say, the only reason I'm here, I've done everything I should have did. This came at me because God's ready to promote me. He, he's ready to elevate me. He just has to make sure that I'm ready. Everything with God in life, although God gave us love, everything we have to promote, we get promoted, we have to graduate, we have to take tests. We think because we get saved that that's it, that I can walk freely now. Go in the store, they're still going to charge you for those potatoes. They don't care how saved you are. You're going to pay that light bill. Yeah, pay that house note. Yes, you are. Yeah, we, the only thing we skim on is tithes and offerings. Everything else we pay. Because we don't want to be in a crisis, which trips me out because when you don't pay that, you bring a curse on yourself. Now you're in a crisis spiritually. You don't know why you're working so hard and can't get out of it. That's another time. That, that's a whole other time. When you face a crisis, you know who your true friends are. How many, can, how many can, hallelujah on that one? I thought they were my friend. I thought my family loved me until I told them my vision and I needed somebody to help support it financially. I know they had the money. Uncle Bud had the money. He had the money, but he didn't believe in me. He didn't want to sow into me. But he always sowed into them the young girls. I mean, know what I'm talking about. You've had family members. They had it, but they wouldn't give it to you. Magic Johnson said that you know your true friends when you're in a crisis. Why? It, it doesn't make sense that they, it seems like your friends should be with you when you're in a crisis, but most, most friends scatter. How many have been there? Now, when, you, when you're doing good, it's income tax season, everybody calls. They know you got a little money, everybody call. Brother, everybody call, because he got a little money now. We going out tonight, we balling. We gonna party tonight all on B. Yeah, he gonna set it out for everybody now on B. Money run dry, the phone goes silent. His friends put him in a state of shock, which caused him to go into crisis, because he shouldn't have never been buying all that. Y'all know what I'm talking about, Five. Somebody don't leave me out here by myself. You know, you out there at the bar, and you want everybody to know you at the bar, so you just buy the first round for everybody. You got a credit card. Yeah, you just got a new credit card, but the credit card is one of those you have to pay on to keep the, the limit. And it's okay because you're trying to establish your credit, but your flesh puts you in a crisis. Y'all looking at me crazy, but y'all know I'm telling the truth. I want to get into the message after this. Seeds of faith are always within us. Sometimes it takes a crisis to nourish and encourage their growth. Leave that up for me, Tanya. Look at what it. Seeds of faith are always within us. And the reason I like this is because the Bible says that before we were born, God knew us. Everything we were going to need in a lifetime, God had already instilled in us. We knew this coming out of the womb that we were equipped for our vision. You're equipped for your vision, but you forget about the vision when crisis come. You, you forget about who you are. 
And most times we start listening to what people say we are, and so we actually get the title from what people think we are versus what God has already sown in us. Seeds of faith are always within us. Sometimes it takes a crisis to nourish and encourage their growth. Crisis. Crisis. People say they come to church because they have problems. You don't have problems, you have crisis. Because I've learned, I've seen people stay home who had problems. They'll stay home and they got a problem because a problem you feel like you can figure it out. I wish I had somebody in here who passed the SAT. They would have been up on that. It's true. People with problems will stay home. People with a crisis run for help. They, they run for help. Toaster burned up, I can put it out at the house. House burned up, I got to call the fire department. That's a crisis. That, that's a crisis. Some of you had kids that were, they were, they were a little bad, baby, but now they're crisis, criminals. Shooting everywhere, strong arm and robbing. How do we get there? How do we get to the point to where crises are starting to handle us? Not, not just in your own individual life, but internationally. You look at the war. Ukraine hadn't did anything to Russia. Russia's leader decides he wants to go back in time and take the land of somebody else because back in the day that land was Soviet Union's land, communist land. But they had since been free, so he wants to strong arm them. And how does he strong arm them? By promoting a crisis. He promotes a crisis for the whole world to see babies dying in this crisis. I think President Biden just said we're going to get 100,000 refugees from Ukraine over here in the next couple of months. Now that's a crisis. We're sending a ton of money there, and we should, because somebody need to help them. Because if we don't, Putin's going to get worse in what? Bringing about a definitive crisis and put it up under the title of war. Something from his imagination has started running rapid because of laws that people have made, the rich have made over time, to suppress the poor. How y'all think the great U.S. of A. got going? Crisis. Started with the bartering system, and then it went into crisis. And you had a few people who had more land than others, had took more land than others, and what they do? They go out there and build laws that suit them. And then they go out there and they do the Boston Tea Party, and then they start coming up with something called the Constitution. And who the Constitution work for? It doesn't work for a color, it works for wealth. And it brings about crisis. And then you start having separate parties. Because that's all it's about, money. We, we don't like to call it because we don't like to read it. Brian, so we, don't, we don't like that part of church. We just like to feel good in church. But when you really start digging in the dirt as we've been talking about and start getting into the bottom of the soil, this is really where we are. You look at households. Most divorce come from lack of finances. Crisis. Back in the day, a woman could have 10 kids, was a stay-at-home mom, wash the clothes, put them out on the line. They ate fresh food every day, lived longer. Now you got two kids in the house, two parents that are working full-time jobs, eating out every day. Wondering why the kids are 15 and diabetic. Better doctors. We're putting ourselves in a crisis. We're stimulating this crisis, if you would. COVID-19 was a crisis, an international crisis. Look where it puts you. Did it stop you from achieving your goals? Think about how many vision killers COVID-19 slaughtered. How many visions, how many goals? COVID-19 slaughtered because it came in the form of a crisis. 
I wish more people, DeAndre, would look at the cross as an inherent readiness for a crisis. I wish that people would look at the cross with Jesus on it and say, this is a crisis. It has to move people to seize this opportunity. But no, we look at it as a day to hide eggs, dress the kids up. The only time of the year they dress up. Dress the kids up on Easter. Come to church. Church packed on Easter. Preachers don't even get excited about the church being packed on Easter. Because you know why people are driven. The true crisis happened on the cross. It happened on the cross. Not in a suit that's going to be too small for little Johnny in two months. We put too much work into things that depreciate and bring us no value. And we put ourselves in crisis because you know you couldn't afford those pants. You, you know you shouldn't have purchased those shoes. You keep buying. And then the devil got you thinking that it's okay. No, you're starting to put yourself and dig a hole that's going to eventually become a crisis. So what if everybody else at the job drives a nice car? You just wait your turn and say, when I get mine, it's going to be that much more valuable to me. We put ourselves in crisis. And then the personal crisis that we deal with, the, the exams that bring about crisis, the, the illnesses. Nowadays, if somebody sneezes, everybody. You okay? You, have, you, you got the shot? I mean, seriously. Crisis, illness. The greatest killer amongst man is strokes. They call it the silent killer. But men won't go to the doctor and get physicals. And then they get sick, they bring the crisis on their wives and the children because we don't ready ourselves and take care of the business that we should take care of. And so we leave ourselves out there for the world to sip us up. And as the world sips us up, it causes us to go into crisis mode. Why are we in crisis mode? Because I'm finally at a place where I'm vulnerable. Because having COVID it makes you vulnerable because you don't know. I had Mother Ann who almost died from COVID. Talk to her, go in the ambulance, go into the hospital. She got worse in the ambulance. But she saw it as an opportunity. She saw it. She didn't go out there and say, I'm to go and drop it as much as I can at the club for the next 10 years because I don't know. She said, no, I'm going to try to get every soul I can saved. That, that's opportunity. That, that's opportunity. Death. Death brings about crisis. You want to see people act indignant? Let somebody black die. Okay, I'm in the wrong church tonight. I need to. They, 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 they cut up all through the church. And I get so tired of shaking family's hands and everybody in the family say the same thing. I got to get back in church. I'm coming back to church. And I'll be like, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Strengthen the family, Lord. Because once they leave the church and finish crying over her, they're going to be laughing over Marvin Gaye with some Jack Daniels. Because we don't really hearken to crisis. We don't look at the opportunity and, and define line of what a crisis can do for us. We don't look at it and say, this will make me better. It's tough. I don't like it. It's irritating. I'm getting I'm lack of sleep right now, deprivation. That's okay. It's going to make you better. The Bible tells me that too much is given. Much is required, and I'm glad that I'm able to stay in the fight now. I always tell Christians, if a Christian say they're a Christian and they don't have no scars, you need to run. Because the day you give your life to Christ is the day the enemy starts coming and fighting you. For one, the enemy wants to stop you before you get momentum started. Yeah, and he wants to try to defame you 
before you gain the most precious momentum. Momentum is a beast. Whoo, Chicago, momentum is a beast, man. Once you get going, it's hard to stop you. But if I can stop you before you get going, if I can stop you while you're walking, I ain't got to worry about it. But if you're running, I'm going to have some problems. Let's try to run with the crisis. Losing jobs. Losing jobs is another form of a crisis individually, and it can spread into the household depending on if it's the head of household or where your money fit into the house. Losing a job is a serious crisis. Not as bad as right now as it has been, because there are a lot of jobs out there now, people just won't go and apply for them. I'm like, you don't have to steal right now, young brother. They got jobs out here paying $20 an hour. So what that brings? People don't want to work. And when you don't want to work and you're lazy, that means you're going to make somebody else's life hard because you're going to steal, rob, or strong arm them. You're going to be out here playing these, these games on people and hoodwinking people, tricking people out of their money. So not only are the recipients of crisis, a lot of people out here are the interrogators of crisis. They're out here just wreaking havoc. So we was on our way getting ready to come to church, me and my wife, a little boy on the train at Lenox Square, stole a bag. It was the wrong bag. He steals the bag, Bronson, and it was a military guy bag, so he had military equipment in there. So they go and just tell his, go call the base, and they go and pinpoint where the bag is. The boy thought he had got away. He on the train, left Lenox. These two undercover, you know how they dress like everybody else, officers come up to him. Caught him dead to the left. I don't know what was worse, the kid stealing somebody bad or the kid couldn't have been over 14. We're in a crisis. Oh, we're in a crisis. This country is definitely in a crisis. Crisis equals usual coping skills that have failed. The coping skills that I normally use, they have now since failed. But the problem still presents itself. So when I've tried all I know to try and the problem is still there, I got issues. And as I have issues, what comes next? The cousin called anxiety. And anxiety starts to rise. And as the anxiety rises, and I can't stop it because I've utilized all my coping mechanisms, now I got to go over here and do what David did. I got to pray. The Bible says it right here in the text. R verse number one, he said, have mercy on me. My God, have mercy on me. H have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. But David, you got to understand, David was one of the most beautiful men to ever walk through earth, according to the Bible. They say, Mother Anne, they say his body was like a God-like trombone. So he was just, just a beautiful something to look at. He, he was beautiful. And they say he could fight. Ooh, he was physical. Yeah, God had given him all these tools. He was physical. But he's at a point now to where somebody else got the gun. Well, they say it ain't, it ain't no fun when your homie got the gun. It ain't no fun when, no, now somebody else got the gun. Now David is being chased by Saul. Preach, man. Good God Almighty, Jesus. Now he's being chased by Saul. The chapter before this, he's still praying the same prayer that he prayed right here. The chapter before this, look at what he says. Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. That's the chapter before. They've been running and chasing David, man, and David's at the point now where David's getting tired, but he know if I stop, Saul's gonna kill me. What do you do when your enemy is after you and you can't stop running? If you stop, your enemy is gonna kill you. If you stop, your fatigue going to kill you. If you stop running, your mind is going to kill you. You stop running, the, the naysayers are going to kill you. What do you do when the one who's trying to stop what God has for you to do is chasing you? He's in a place now. This strong man who has the merit, who has, who has killed the, the, the giants, Goliath. 
He, he's killed lions and bears when they tried to kill the sheep. So he's proven in his fighting resume, but there's always somebody bigger. There's always an enemy greater. Always an enemy stronger and always an enemy smarter. David's in a place. And most people, Mother Anna, say David's in a tough place. But I look at it and say David was in a place of opportunity. That while they're chasing him, he never stopped praying. He knew the whole time, I'm, oh, I'm running. Lord, help me. Oh, Lord, help me. Have you ever been there? Hmm. You tried all you could. And you couldn't remember scriptures, but you can remember, Lord, have mercy. I'm talking about somebody who's been in a crisis. Who, Lord, have mercy. What am I to do? You left me with all this down here by myself. What am I to do? Have mercy. Oh, my, oh, my father. David's, he's at this place. He states right here, have mercy on me. I like how he personalized the first lady and says, my God. Comes back in the next clause and says it again, have mercy on me. If this would have been a little wimp, this wouldn't have meant so much to me. But he was the fighter of the old covenant. David. When they talk about Jesus, they say Jesus was of the lineage and the bloodline of David. Had to be something to David for David to have to sit here and hide from Saul the king. If you read a little bit before this, you'll see how David even fabricated. He fabricated to get away from another king whose territory he had ran in. They knew that this king didn't play either, but he was more afraid of Saul because he had been with Saul a long time. Be careful who you hang with. He had been hanging with Saul all this time, and now Saul knew that David was anointed, so but, but so he knew that David was anointed. He said, I'm going to kill David because if David's that much more anointed, David's going to take my crown. Yeah, because see, David was one who was anointed. Oh, my God. He was one who was anointed to, to be the king of Israel, not other land. He was born specifically, trained specifically, learned how to kill specifically to come back and, and, and forge the leadership that was needed in Israel. He was trying to get there. Yeah, so when you, you look and you think about all this, you say, wow, I, I never knew that David had to run sometimes. Crisis don't mean you're scared. When you have to move sometime and maneuver, it means you're wise. It means you're wise. Because that's where he was. He was, he was at the point to where he, I can't fight Saul. For one, him and Saul's son were best friends. They were best friends. Saul didn't care about his son. That's what I'm saying. You have to be careful, man, who you associate with. Because they were your friend yesterday don't mean they should be your friend today and tomorrow you should get their number out your phone. Everybody can't be your friend all the time. They going the wrong way and you're still trying to hold on to that dust puppy. What are they going to do for you? Nothing but put you in a crisis. And it might not be physically, it might be spiritually, but they're going to put you there. Crisis is defined as a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. Some of us like to say, look at crisis as a catastrophe, an emergency, or disaster, a predicament, a time when a difficult or important decision must be made. Ain't nothing like making a decision in a crisis. When, when a man really wants to show his worth and his salt, watch how he handles crisis. See if he stands the line with the Lord and say, but God said this. Or do his friends coerce him into other areas? Or alcohol coerce him into doing things that he shouldn't? Or drugs or substance abuse? Or ladies? Ladies? La ladies? Cause the most potent poison for a man 
is a woman that's, un that's unhinged. Them unhinged women, they rough because they know how to use you. The strongest men in the Bible all along were brought down, not by great warriors and great kings, Latanya, but women. Women brought them down, tricked them, used all kind of bodily devices to hypnotize them, brought about crisis. Have you talked to Samson? Delilah? How Delilah used Samson? To figure out his strength, it was in his hair. She finally worked her way around. God, that's what crises do. It, she worked her way around till she got him to the point to where he was relaxed. He felt like he could trust her. Oh, he felt like he could trust her. And trust her he did. And she brought a crisis with her. Not only did he die, he died blind. He, he didn't even, in his last breath, he couldn't even see the creation of the Most High God. You cannot let your guard down. If you do, you're subjecting yourself to a crisis. A lot of people attitudes get jacked up and it ain't that person it's what's driving them mother it's the crisis that that that's beating them and driving them all kind of they just ah, they ah, they're just running all around i don't know and on the way they come by you and flip you a bird and keep going ah, ah. and you know what it ain't the person it's the crisis think about it when your mom was struggling the most you better not ask your mama for no money to go on the field trip Mama speak all kind of languages, Portuguese, everything. I mean, mama just be gone. It ain't that mama don't love you. It's the way. Crisis. The crisis gets you. I'm telling you. How many know what I'm talking about? How many men know about silent crisis? Yeah, it, it, all the men should have your hand. Silent crisis. Dangerous crisis because silent crisis brings on silent frustration. And when silent frustration comes, that's what kills a man because he won't say it because we're not built to fuss and argue back and forth. We can do it for about five minutes. After that, we'll just give in. We, we're not giving in to you because you won. We're giving in because we don't want to start no crisis. Can't sleep at night when a crisis is looming in the room. You on that side of the bed. I'm on this side of the bed. We, we ain't going to touch me. You saw these women laugh. You know why they're laughing? They're laughing because they're saying, ouch. They're like, yeah, Pastor, I, <laughs> I've been there, Pastor God, but I changed. I've changed, Pastor. I mean, seriously, this, this thing that this guy's going through is serious. Most people fear crisis because they can't gauge the turning point. You don't know when you coming out of it. You just know I'm in a dark place. I'm in a place where I feel alone. Uh, I'm in a place where it seems like even my family has turned against me. You, you're like what happened when your wife or your children stop? Look, Pee Wee, cuss you out at the school. Oh, you don't fed and work two jobs to get Pee Wee them jocks. Okay, I'm sorry. How I many know what I'm talking about, jocks? You know them jocks, you got them from Tom McCann. Yeah, the only thing you can do is get the color shoe strings to make them look better. That was a crisis. Because you wearing jocks to school, and everybody else was back during that time wearing Converse All-Stars. I'm 53. So those are probably 43, 42 and older to understand how prevalent Converse were back in the day. So prevalent that we would wash them on our hands with a toothbrush with the soap, wash them, and then once we rinse them, we put salt on them. Make them white. Because I didn't want to go to school and everybody looking at my, I got to make them last. Because I couldn't get no more. Mama got them at August. I can't get no more to Christmas. 
They won but $15 back in the day. That's just how times were, crisis. Crisis. I remember when people were selling food stamps for real to try to pay light bills and try to keep it moving and get the family. Now people getting two and three thousand dollars worth of food stamps. They selling them so they can get some bleep bleep. They got the new Apple phone and don't even work. You know how that make me feel, Bronson, when I'm in this line at the store and I see somebody who's young. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it tonight, Dorsey. Because I feel it. Somebody in the pulpit got to start saying this. It's a discrimination and an abomination that I'm in line working all these hours every day. And I see a young cat in here sagging, paying down here with some Kmart flip flops on, and the girl right there with him chewing bubble gum, and both of them got those nice Apple phones, and they got three buggies. And I look at my wife, and we got the LeCary. And we don't count it, everything getting there, taxes and all. It's about to be a crisis. Because I get in the line, and I just, my wife be ready to see, don't say nothing. No. All them sweets they got up there, I need some of that ice cream. Because my taxes are paying for that ice cream. They need to ask me, do I want? But see, people don't like to hear the truth. They don't like to hear the truth, man. You know what they like to hear? And God's going to bless you. No, God says, without knowledge, my people shall perish. That's what God said. We always get the scriptures that make us feel good. And that's why our soul decay. And our soul is rotten because we don't eat the things of the Bible that makes us grow. Like, how do you overcome a crisis? How do you stay away from a crisis? How do you go through a crisis? How do you even admit that you're in a crisis? Who do you go to when you're in a crisis? How do you talk to him when you go to him when you're in a crisis? Do you believe when you're in a crisis? How's your prayer life when you're in a crisis? Do you still get up and shout when you're in a problem? I'm telling you, this is the crisis. We don't want to hear about crisis. No, we don't want to hear about it. I mean, we all have them. Why we don't like to talk about the things we all have? We like to talk about things we dream about. Girl, I, oh, I saw Denzel. I saw Denzel walk the red carpet. This is my mama. My mama, every, she's always dreaming about Denzel. And I think I put her in a crisis mode because I've been telling my mama I want a daddy. I said, Mama, I'm 53 now. All I want from you is a daddy. <laughs> and then she comes back, I don't want, you ain't getting no daddy. I'm like, Mama, please stop blocking your blessings. <laughs> it's truth. Some of you are going through crisis because you sow bad seeds. Some of you are where you are. TV, listen because of what you sow. You sow negative seeds, and then you expect a great harvest, a plentiful harvest. No, you sow these negative seeds. The Bible say you reap what you sow. You sow negative, you reap negative. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. The reason people don't fool with you, cause you negative. You're like a rotten egg. People don't like rotten eggs. They smell. Yeah, that, that, exactly. Crisis. We, we're putting ourselves in crisis because what we're sowing. You want to be the greatest? You want to be the best in your company? So. You want to be at the top of your company? So. I love the way UPS structure their organization. Because at UPS, you have to earn. I was in grad school. That was one of the papers I had to write. Which organization that you really admire their, their infrastructure? I, I, I love UPS. I know y'all like the new Prime. Uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon moving stuff too. I haven't studied them, but I'll tell you what I have studied. I've studied UPS, and I love their infrastructure. You know why? Because they minimize crisis because they only hire from within. In their management, they hire people that's been on the line. So to become a supervisor, they pull somebody from within, not because they work hard, but because they understand the culture. Yeah, 
You don't, you don't move me by coming to me saying 50 scriptures. What you move me by is learning to adapt, adjust, and make the culture better. When you buy in, is what they say in that UPS, you've been there 15 years, you deserve a chance. I know you ain't leaving no time soon. I love it. And I like how God do it too. He chooses from within. He chooses from within. Paul wasn't Paul until he bought in. Before Paul, he was Saul, killing Christians. Uh, better yet, more dangerous, he had other people killing them. He had a little short Paul had all these people reeking up and raking up this crisis by having them killing Christians. Men, women, children, he didn't care. And the ones he couldn't kill right there, he had them locked up. And they say he would sit back there and smile. A crisis on steroids is what he was. Some of you have crisis that you feel on steroids. That some of your crisis, you're sad. You're lonely. Some don't have the money they feel they deserve. Some are not where they want to be in life. And so what happens? You make it a crisis. And as you make it a crisis, it becomes a whirlwind. Something you can't get out. And I'm talking about your soul. Your soul is in a crisis state. You know you're in a cyclone, but you just don't know how to get out. Every day you wake up is torture because you are more happy sleep, partially unconscious, than when you're awake. How can you live being in that state of mind to where I'm on the run all the time and some of this is self-afflicted? You can't blame everything on the devil. In fact, we give the devil too much praise because for some of us, he don't have to do anything. You do it for him. You go in and stamp that time clock for him every day, gossiping on the phone, lying over there in the break room, lying to your kids. You're ashamed of yourself. Little Johnny just started the job. You're already in his pocket. Son can't even keep no money. Dead all in his pocket. Hey, let me hold 20. You know, you, you patting him while you're talking to him. Hey, let me, let me hold, let me hold 20. We create crisis. We are afraid to say that we have a crisis, but we enjoy living it. How can that be? How is it that David, the magical, Majestical David have to run from Saul. How he had to hide in a cave. Next week we're gonna start back with what happened when he got to a place he couldn't run no more. And they say his dad and the mom sent all the guys, all the guys who came to the cave where David was. None of them bought him joy. You know what they did? They brought more sorrow. Because most times when you hang around people who are depressed, they'll bring depression on you. Both people, when they don't have joy, hang around them long enough, you won't have joy. You have to watch it. And David had 400 men in there with him. And they all were depressed. And so now he got to be uplifting to ensure, because these were people from his town. Interesting. I want to show you next week what, his, what he did with his mom and dad. Still, while they're in the midst of this conflict, 
and why Saul is chasing him. I say that to say that just because things aren't going the way you think they should don't mean you should stop going. You should continue to read your word, study your word, sure yourself's approved. You should continue to tell yourself every day, I am somebody, I'm a child of the most high God. People only can do to you what you let them do. You have to give Satan permission. Hmm? Oldest book in the Bible, Job. The devil had to ask God for permission to tempt Job, okay. That's what you say now. So don't think that when things are going wrong that God's not on your side. He just wants to see if you'll pass this test. Is it a problem or is your crisis an opportunity? Put your hands together. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight, God. You're so glorious, wonderful, magnificent you are. Thank you, God, from the, the heavens you see all things, that your eyes are in every place. We thank you, Lord, that you'll make us rich in your way and out of no sorrows. We thank you, Father, for the peace tonight that surpasses all understanding. I pray that someone tonight is at the point, Lord, where they're going to put up. They're going to stop talking and be about it. Somebody tonight is going to look and say, I am more than what I'm selling myself for. My value is greater than what I think it is. Lord, let no stone go unturned in their lives. I thank you for favor in every area of their lives, in their travels, God, on the highways and the byways. Father, I thank you. Families are being mended. Minds are being renewed. Spirits are being restored. Oh, we thank you, Father, for greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Lord, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor and we give you praise because truly you're worthy. I thank you for every person who heard the word tonight. Let it resonate in their hearts. Let them be fulfilled spiritually. I thank you that everywhere their feet tread, that becomes holy ground. Lord, in your son Jesus' name, we thank you for our new normal. We thank you, Lord, for what you have in store for us from this day forward. We thank you that now we are your children and you are our God. Thank you for this day that you made, and we shall continue to rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, God, we thank you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Put those hands together. Somebody say amen.